can we talk about the Sex and the City uh, moment in this movie? What? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs> Everybody, sweet mama, the beat. baby. All right, oh, it God. is <laughs> one fucking hour time. Of course, the show where we talk about one goddamn movie for one fucking hour. I am Evan Husney, and I got to my left, Big T, Tom Fitz G. What's going on, man? How you doing? How's your week? Hey, here we go. It's uh, another day, another episode. Let's do it. Let's sink okay. our teeth into this thing. Mm, yeah, this is a tasty. This is a tasty one, um, and we got <laughs> to my right. We got uh, as always here, uh, Mr. Marcus Herring. What's going on, Marcus? Really stoked about the episode this week. What are we on? 1976. Six, six, six. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> of course, uh, 1976. Also, episode 76. And this is the movie that y'all voted for on our poll for the year 1976. We're, of course, covering tonight our first Roman Polanski film, and it is going to be The Tenant. Okay. Very I'm surprised this one, uh, this one won, but very cool. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Me too. A little bit. I wasn't quite expecting the fanfare around this movie because obviously it's not, you know, it's not Rosemary's Baby, which also didn't win the poll that it was yeah. on in 68 or whatever that was but what, what um, were the contenders again you're gonna make me pull this up again okay oh, I, should, I gotta i gotta have I, this I, I always think i always think you have this like sheet uh never like, ask that question uh, and, and i also i, I and also i'm ashamed that all three of us can't remember i know movie. okay i got it I got i'm it. drawing a complete name blank. one movie from 1976 <laughs> we, we did rocky Just one we put it on the list twice right i don't know so i got it i got rocky it. uh no Okay, this is what it they was. Should say uh, Pittsburgh. <laughs> okay, the tenant <laughs> beat out. I, I was surprised it beat out Carrie. That I was very surprised. Oh, I uh, thought it would win. Yes, that that the Carrie that fans would show up. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I was kind of yeah. chomping at the bit to cover that because I mean, I, I I do love that movie. I think it's De Palma's best. Yeah. I think it's you know, I think it's incredible. Sissy Spacek, yo. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And then we got um, uh, all the president's men. Was another one yeah, which didn't turn like up yeah. well at the polls, but then, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I do love that movie, man. That movie is incredible. That's no, great. It's so fun. Yeah. It's so. so I think amazing. it's just played on TV so much. You know, maybe, maybe. everyone got burnt out or something. Maybe it's all, it used to always be on. Maybe, and yeah. then it was Mikey and Nikki, y'all. Which I was a little right. bummed out. Deep uh, cut. Yeah. De- well, deep we'll have cut. to return to that. Yeah, we're gonna force that one on y'all at some point down the line. We're big it's fans. Yeah. Big okay. fans. Big fans. Okay. But but here, here we, we are, are, the tenant. And it's it's going to be great. Nineteen seventy six. Um, this is a this is a this is a this is a awesome movie. I'm really excited y'all picked it. There's yeah. a lot to talk about tonight in terms yeah. of the themes and you know Roman Polanski starring in this movie. It's there's a lot to get into, which of course we will. But uh, guys, little uh, unfortunate breaking news as of yesterday, I believe, as we're recording this. Um, we got the news that William Friedkin, uh, had passed away. Um, you know, he was well into his eighties into his late eighties, but, um, you know, he's a director whose films we've covered here a lot on the show, uh, in the archives right now. You can check out one fucking hour on French connection. We went to town on that. We love the sort of doc realism that he employs and the method directing style of, you know, getting deep into the research of anything he's working on. Such a revolutionary film to be a huge hit in 1971, you know? Totally, totally. Huge, huge movie. And then also one of our most viewed episodes ever is One Fucking Hour on Cruising, which we went to town on, getting into the real life true crime story that inspired it, the intersecting webs of that, and just kind of looking at that film in hindsight. There's a fascinating subject, whether you like it or you don't, or you think it's okay. There's a lot to talk about there. So... We acknowledge, we want to acknowledge Friedkin as you know uh, a very unique talent in the uh, realms of cinema, but he's also been a big force here on the show. We've referenced him many times across many of the episodes, and we feel that um, you know, in light of his passing, as a way to honor and to pay tribute to Mr. Friedkin, that next week 
We're going to forego the poll because next week, of course, would be episode 77, the year 1977. And we're going to pick uh, the winner ourselves, which this might have won anyway. Uh, but we're going to cover, in honor of right. Mr. Friedkin, Sorcerer. So next week, no poll. We're just going to go right into it and talk about one of uh, his more fascinating films, epic backstory, insane behind the scenes making of story. Um, we're going to get into it's one like, fucking hour on Sorcerer. What movie yeah. do you make when you've just made the most popular film of all time? The Exorcist. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, what do you do in the next yeah. four years? <laughs> like, go ahead, mm -hmm. William. You know, a bunch of cocaine. And drag a bunch of people into the jungle. <laughs> That's what you do. Yeah. So and, and um, burn bridges yeah. all throughout uh, Beverly Hills yeah, in Hollywood. for decades. Yeah, yeah, yeah That's exactly. Awesome. So uh, that's the plan for next week, everybody. No poll this week. We're gonna, in, in terms of you know, we're gonna honor, um, pay tribute to William Friedkin next week. One fucking hour on Sorcerer. Um, and then right before we get into the show, guys, I just want to give one last quick shout out here to the One Fucking Hour Patreon. Uh, Patreon.com slash One Fucking Hour is the best way to support the show. If you're a fan of what we do here, we appreciate everybody who signed up thus far. We're building a sweet community on, uh, it's a, um, over it's on about, Patreon. Um, it's about 100,000 so far, right? We're, it's we're at about a, right on the cusp of about 100,000 oh, okay. subs. Yeah. Yeah. Give or take. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, right. yeah. That's, that's not bad. All right. Thank you to everybody who signed up thus far. Yeah. We have been recording DVD style feature length audio commentary tracks. It's the only way to get those. So if you want to hear more of what we do, uh, you want to watch movies with us. It's pretty much like hanging out and watching movies and watching us react to movies in real time. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. we have just recorded maybe the most insane choice for an audio commentary <laughs> that we've ever done, which of course is, uh, I don't know why we did this, but we fucking did it. We did a DVD commentary to what women want starring <laughs> Mel Gibson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big yeah. Three W yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as we call it around here. Oh man. It is seriously, yeah. I kind of undersold this the last week when we talked about it. But this is an insane movie from insane people <laughs> with an insane outlook in the world. It's so wrong. This movie deserves to be looked at again with fresh eyes. <laughs> However, yeah. 25 years later, we're at now with this. It's insane. Uh -huh. What women want. We're watching it. Tom's reacting to it. Get on the Patreon. That's mm -hmm. the only way you can get it. So patreon.com slash one fucking hour or scroll to the bottom of the YouTube page if you're watching us on YouTube. Click the join button and you can sign up on YouTube for five bucks a month. Same price, same benefits, same shit. We love you all just the same. And thank you all for your support. So if you want to get that shit, yeah. get on there. So thank you guys very much, whoever signed up already. And we look awesome. forward to uh, to uh, new bros on there as well, too. All right. So um, y'all ready for tonight's episode, The Tenant? Should we start up the clock? Should we get this going? Yeah. Clock it up. Start it up. All right. Clock is... Just getting set, and it is live now. All right. Okay, a little bit of backstory on this movie. Okay, Roman Polanski's The Tenant. Here we go. Okay, against the backdrop of the daunting housing shortage in, the, in 1970s Paris and the suspicious suicide attempt of the young Egyptologist Simon Schul, the mousy naturalized Frenchman Trelkovsky, who is played by Roman Polanski himself, decides to try his luck at moving into the desperate woman's now vacant flat. But as the new renter does his best to comply with the draconian rules of the gloomy tenement building's landlord, Monsieur Z, and learn to live with the spiteful neighbors' insidious in intimidation, more and more, Trelkovsky finds himself enmeshed in a real or perhaps imagined web of conspiracy. Now as Trelkovsky succumbs to the malevolent building's urban paranoia, hearing voices and seeing things, he becomes convinced that the building's other occupants are plotting to kill him. Are Trelkovsky's fears justified, or is the tenant starting to lose his fragile grip on reality? So there you have it, The Tenant. Um, one of my favorite movies of, uh, of Polanski's. A lot of things firing on all cylinders here, including Polanski's performance, Sven Nykvist is shooting this, Bergman's usual cinematographer. Yeah. It's beautiful um, and is a really 
weird ass movie as well too <laughs> like it is. like like for real um it, I, I think it's uh that that's um to say the least yeah yeah i was just gonna just quickly add that so there's so many like ofh like heavy hitters that are, that are like involved in this movie like you said sven nyquist but also roland topor who yep. came up in another episode before uh, we'll El get Topo. to him isabella johnny you know from our uh, possession, possession episodes in this movie so yeah. It's sort right. of like uh, there's a lot of heavy hitters from uh, past episodes yeah, in this movie. for sure. Yeah, this is the one fucking hour hit club here for sure. <laughs> um, but Marcus, before we were recording, you were mentioning that uh, you had sort of a, an impressionable first experience with The Tenet. Yeah, it's kind of weird, but this is one of the first. I know, I've said this before a few times for other movies, but this really is one of the first movies I saw that wasn't like E.T. or Star Wars or something, oh, you know, wow. kind of an offbeat movie. My dad... <laughs> was a huge Polanski fan. Um, you know, I've only ever seen it on VHS, so it was kind of interesting. To, it was really fun to watch it, like a really nice, like, 1080 version of it. Uh, yeah. I'd never seen it in this detail before, but, um, you know, we had it on VHS as a kid. Um, my, my dad, like I guess, was a big Polanski fan, so he always had this sort of outsized uh, stature in my mind. He was always one of the big directors to me, like, you know, it was like Scorsese you know, uh, Coppola, Polanski, you know, and, and I knew what he looked like because I not only this movie, but my dad also showed me Fearless Vampire Killers, <laughs> um, which scared the shit out of me. I didn't realize that it was a comedy back then. And if I go back and watch the, even the the opening titles with the dripping blood and the music, it still like it. Get, hits me with those chills that I had as a kid. I still get kind of freaked out by it. Oh, so years later, when I actually watched it and realized it was a comedy, I was, it was complete shock. But yeah. for The Tenant, I totally caught the humor. I was yeah. rewatching it this time. I remember my dad calling out specific moments to me, like when the dog is snipping at Polanski's hand, you know, mm -hmm. that there's a, a, a joke there or um, when he's uh, making out in the theater and turns around and sees the guy staring at them. I remember my dad laughing mm -hmm. at that. And so it's like my dad almost kind of taught me like what dark humor was <laughs> by watching wow, this movie, right, you know? Right. Wow. Uh, so it had a big impact on me, um, you know, uh, so I, I have a kind of a skewed vision of it. And then years later when I decided I was going to be like a movie dork or whatever, you know, work at a video store and, and uh, go to the Alamo and all that stuff, I, uh, you know, I revisited this movie and used to show it to friends and stuff and get their sort of uh, impressions of it. So it definitely had a big impact on just like my worldview as a movie enthusiast. Yeah, it's 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 funny because I had a interesting experience with it as well. Like I worked at a video store as well when I was young, you know, during college, and I had um, a friend who's this was his favorite movie. Uh, he was a colleague of mm -hmm. mine. The Tenant was mm -hmm. literally his favorite movie. His handle, like on Facebook or social media, was Simon Shul. Like he was the ultimate <laughs> fanboy of. <laughs> uh, like of this movie or i think it was his email address was simon shul at like right. aol or something um but he 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 turned me on to this movie and i have to admit like knowing rosemary's baby and knowing you know polanski's other films knife in the water or, you know whatever like i sort of watched this as a thriller first like that's how the first mm. lens that i saw it in and it wasn't until yeah. like i really started appreciating it and seeing it multiple times that like it's true sense of humor black comedy started to like peek through for me because it is a really funny film it has a lot of really funny moments that in any other context would be like huge like belly laugh moments in another movie like the one moment that pops in my mind like is probably the biggest laugh for me is when you when Polanski takes that guy out for uh, coffee at the tabac who's distraught over Simon Shul's suicide <laughs> right and then the guy walks into the cafe and is like all right drinks for everybody everyone except him except for you, you know, and that moment. <laughs> no, and the guy's reaction is just like crushed, weeping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With his, like, with his, yeah. Hand, his face in his hand, his hand yeah. in his face. Uh, what do you want to say? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's that, that well, it's it's played with comic timing. Yes, know? it is. Mm -hmm. It is. And, and so is that moment, of course, iconic, the moment where Roman Polanski's character is like, you know, just his mind is starting to shatter and he's like, you know, crossed arms and, in, you know, out there in Paris and then he sees the little kid crying and whining about the boat and he goes up there and smacks oh, the kid yeah. in the face. Filthy little brat. 
you know, the, those yeah. moments are just. But so, it's also disturbing. It <laughs> like, is right. disturbing, but like it's, it's it's harsh yeah. and unnerving. Like the child's yeah. face. Like they got yeah. a nice performance out of that little kid's face. You know, like yeah. totally. Uh, Totally. Like pure, like anguished emotion. Well, uh, to to keep running with this. Um, well, yeah. my little thing that gets me. I don't know if it's humor or funny, but it's sort of almost like a cringe comedy moment where that his neighbor just knocks on the door and goes like, "Hey, I shit in front of everybody's doorway." <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. Just like, like, all right. She's like, "Oh, they're gonna love that." And he's like, "Okay, yeah. all right, bye." Yeah. And then you just yeah. see her almost comically. Yeah. You see her like uh, having comically traverse down towards the end of this you know this hall into the steps when he wants to go like hey and she's like yeah, out and then he has to like clean it up and it's just like uh <laughs> it's just like a i think absurd is the word you mm -hmm. know like too like yeah. uh, theater of the absurd is a big yes you know early mid 20th century influence on all these kind of um world war ii babies i'd like to call them and what i mean is um yeah this is us. an adaptation of of our boy uh roland topor uh, I always figure I'm pronouncing that right, but I might not be. This is one of his books, and um, he was one of the panic movement people. So that's, uh, you know, Ordorowski, as we've mentioned before, also Arabal, the avant-garde filmmaker and playwright. And what I mean is um, the humor is evident through all of um, uh, Topor's, uh, he, he did write, but he also did all these daily illustrations in newspapers, and um, they're funny and grim. I don't know, this is just a random mm -hmm. example, and probably no one can see this, but uh, you know, it's a little girl who's That's doing cool. um, jump rope and it's severing her feet or legs. Yeah. So it's just, <laughs> right. um, and he also did right, like the design like, work for uh, uh, La Planet Sauvage too, right? He was part of the creative team of Planet Sauvage. But my point is, is that he had a very pitch black sense of humor that was highly visual, and it's almost like it's a dream come true that he winds up working with Polanski mm -hmm. and there's a such a simpatico is what I'm trying to say and if you do look at his illustrations and I highly recommend digging up some of his stuff online or in a book uh, the illustrations specifically uh, you see in the film these moments like when the little girl has a, a, a Polanski mask you know it's, yes. it's and even just the people staring in mm -hmm. the bathroom yes. get pressed, weird, all very Topor-esque is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they did know each other in sort of cafe culture. Polanski's quoted as saying like, oh yeah, he's one of those guys you just see at the cafe every day and we talk about art and politics and girls, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's a real simpatico. So uh, a lot of that humor uh, matches the humor of Polanski is what I'm trying to and say. And it's just one of those great sort of mid 70s confluences of um you know like uh the freaky euro guys you know right mm. and so he so so he wrote the book in which the tenant is based yeah. um and did do you know if he collaborated on the script at all or was he part of the process not from what i've heard w what yeah. i had heard was that uh this the book's from like 1964 it was bought up by a Hollywood studio, believe it or right. not. And it was getting tossed around vaguely for 10 years. And wow. then, uh, it, you know, somebody dusted it off and goes, Roman, you want to check this out? And he, I'm sure, knew, if not the book, you know, Topor, of course. And so he's like, yeah, let's give it a shot. And I think that um, the studio had bought the rights completely to the Tenant novel. So, like, uh, wow. I think that Topor was frozen out. Um, right. So I don't think he collaborated because he yeah. wasn't really, like, invited, you know? Right. I think the person that wrote the text was Gerard Brock, who like wrote with, who collaborated with uh, uh, Polanski on other stuff like Repulsion and Fearless Vampire Killers, oh, wow, and then okay. he, he also wrote um, he wrote the story for Wonderwall, you know that movie, and oh, um, wow. and also uh, Tom Big he'll be big in your mind. He wrote uh, the yeah. screenplay for Quest for Fire. I know that's one of your favorites. Ooh, oh <laughs> hell yeah! <laughs> <laughs> dun, French dun, caveman. Dun, dun, it's French caveman movie, right? Isn't that the, yeah. Quest for yeah. oh, quest for fire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. take two. I thought you said chariots of fire. Like, chariots of fire. <laughs> oh, Saint Saint Elmo's time. fire. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but don't you? Yeah, Saint Elsewhere. What's going on? Yeah. Take two. Oh, quest for fire. I love for quest for fire. fire. Actually, yeah. no. This is crazy. My friend recently contacted me and go, just throwing it out there. Y'all want to fuck with quest for fire on one fucking hour? And that's not <laughs> oh, a bad idea. Actually. Right. Cool. Yeah, it's a good idea. Shout out yeah. to my boy Jason. So uh, anyway, so um, I'm a big Topor fan. I see the influence and yeah. it, it, it's just, it's yeah, it's like a perfect uh, stars aligning moment in mid 70s yeah. uh, art house. Yeah. Well, and, and one thing we should say too about this movie before we kind of unpack it and get into it <clears throat> is that a lot of people, it's one of the first things you hear when anyone talks about this movie 
um, is the idea that it's part of this unofficial apartment trilogy that Polanski has. Of course, he has Repulsion, takes place in an apartment, <laughs> Rosemary's Baby, you know, very central to the, uh, the, the uh, Dakota. Dakota building. Yeah, of mm-hmm. course, in New York City. Yeah. And then, of course, this movie takes place in an apartment. And I think for yeah. each of those movies, it's interesting because they both, wor- or all three of them work in... Uh, as sort of a different allegory, you know, each of the films, right? Like um, you have Repulsion, um, which is amazing, by the way. I would do that in a heartbeat for the oh, show. Yeah. Um, but it's sort of like her apartment, Catherine Deneuve's character in in Repulsion, the apartment is sort of a physical manifestation of her mind, you know, is what yeah. it is in, in, in Repulsion. And of course, in Rosemary's yeah. Baby, you could make the, make a case for it being sort of like, um, her womb is, you know, this apartment and it's bare at first. Mm. And then, of course, they live in and they move in and, mm. you know, as the baby's uh, being born and so on and so forth. Um, but it's interesting with the tenant because literally like the definition of, you know, a tenant is somebody who is a temporary inhabitant of, of a place, you know. But mm-hmm. in this case, it's like somebody who's the temporary inhabitant of someone else's troubled mind, is kind of the one way that I sort of look at this right. because mm. you do literally have in the in the opening of this movie we learn that you know Roman Plancy's character is trying to move into this apartment that is owned by someone who's not dead yet <laughs> is somebody who tried to commit suicide but might out as of well the be yeah yeah but might as well be exactly mm-hmm. and so it's kind of like in some ways you know he has to wait for her to die before to fully take her apartment and then slowly over the course of the movie as we described earlier. Um, he kind of loses sight of his own identity, and it's almost like the rest of the world is kind of forcing uh, this troubled person's identity on him, or maybe that's one way to look at it. Um, but I you know it's very interesting. It does a really great person. job, I think, of being open to interpretation. You know, like I yeah. can't, it's hard to, I was trying to come up with another movie that can be so open and not be a bummer, you know, and even movies that are kind of vague and obscure, like, well, Holland Drive or something, that kind of seems like it has an answer. You know what I mean? And like this sure. movie, I feel like is purposely vague. And there are things that are let, that he left in there to kind of um, to steer you in one direction. And then he left other things to steer you in another direction. But I think yeah. largely it's pretty successful at like being, you know, at having multiple interpretations and, and the audience being okay with that, you know? Yeah. I think one of the first uh, key things in establishing that tone, especially in the first half, is that um, I'll put it this way: like uh, the director is an unreliable um, narrator, as they say in literature. You know, because uh, there's sure. a lot of subjectivity. Like, is he? Are are we seeing as the viewer his subjective view of you know even just day to day reality, mm-hmm. or is it skewed or is it flat? You know, like what normally films are, which is just there's another person in the room looking at everything too, you know, and it's a camera, right. and it's you, the viewer. Right. And and it's just uh and that's one of those great things about surrealism and and, and it starts bubbling up and getting uh, going further into the second half. I will give a shout out to Jonathan Rosenbaum though, the critic. Oh yeah. I just read his review of it from a contemporary review. And he did point out that in the second half he feels that Polanski loses it a bit because there's some tells that give you an understanding that this is maybe more simple than at first it seems. It is just a guy who's simply going crazy. And that if you were in that apartment courtyard to be like, this guy's just crazy and nothing else is happening. No one's persecuting or anything like that. Because mm-hmm. there's two tells. It's like the guy who knocks on Isabella Johnny's door when Polanski sleeps over and then in the morning, it's just mm-hmm. a guy like looking for another apartment. It's not, you know, Mel- Melvin Douglas, the, the landlord. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and what I'm saying is there's the film, for some reason, he decided to have an objective view where we see like it's just a guy who's not the landlord knocking at the door, but right. we also see Melvin through the keyhole, the landlord. Right. And then there's also, um, you see a part where like uh, there's a strangulation, a, a woman is kind of strangling him in the hallway, but then it cuts yeah. to objective reality and he's going yes oh, he's like strangling himself yes. you know like almost like a fight club kind of cutaway right. you know when fight club does that too and sure. i was and i was a little i don't know when i read that rosa bomb kind of fucked me up because i was like <laughs> maybe this is maybe it's a little clearer than we think it's just simply a guy going nuts and half the film is right. obviously is completely subjective ever-growing mental ill view of uh, his reality so i don't know i don't yeah. know 
I, true. I, I know what you're saying. I, I caught those tells, those like quote until uh, quote unquote tells too, like with the yeah. guy in the hallway. Like I totally noted that one this time. Um, mm-hmm. But I yeah. think it's also like open to interpretation, like why he's mad, or like if it's allegorical, okay. what those what those items, could, you know, what could be the allegory sure. behind it? Is it about like? being foreign and being forced to conform like in sure. another country, yes. you know, as a, you know, yeah. is it, is it really personal to him or, you know, like I think there are lots of other avenues to where it's still. Open, Why is he well, crazy? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. there's, there, there is, this is, I mean, one of the things that you could read into in terms of, you know, why this is happening. Cause it's, so it's not just a kind of random in a vacuum. Here's a guy he goes crazy, you know, type thing. I don't know right. if you guys have any thoughts on this, but, you know, one of the more, I, I hate to use the word iconic again, but it kind of is for this movie, is the, is the moment in the film where he, it's really kind of one of the first moments that something weird is going on is when, or maybe quasi supernatural even, when he mm-hmm, moves mm-hmm. the furniture to the side. And of course he sees there's a hole in the wall and inside the wall is a tooth. And that's Dude. where things start to get wall tooth all day. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, I that's know, like I that's know. just classic, like early twentieth century surrealism imagery. Yeah. And I mean that in the best way. It's just yeah, yeah it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. It is. It's simple, but it's effective, and it's a it's, right, exactly. it's totally intriguing. Like what a fucking tooth in the wall. How did he know it's there? Who we don't care. It's like <laughs> it is. It is. It's like a Jodorowsky even type image in a movie. You could see, mm-hmm. you know, it being the there. panic movement. Yeah, exactly. Totally. 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 But here's the thing. One thing that's a little, not to say glossed over, but you have to kind of really, it, it, it may not hit you the first time you see the movie, is that Simon Shul is in, uh, in, you know, studying Egypt. She's into this mm-hmm. Egyptology, right. you know, right. and, there, and there could be a way to read into this that there is some sort of voodoo or something happening in terms of the You're, tooth. Oh, that's true. You know, that well, is sort of Also, happening. like, sort of like reincarnation. Like this yes. mystical reoccurrence, right? You know, yes. like a mummy like, reincarnated, like this a mummy, yes. like the, right. the bandaged body. But it's all yeah. like reoccurring. It's like, yeah, like you know, you've always been dying, and it's, which yeah. is kind of getting into shining territory. I, I, I think is. that would totally be underscored by the by the end too. The fact that he throws himself out the window twice, like that is I like loop. That. You know, that's like a double loop yeah. in the movie. So an Dude. endless reoccurrence. Yeah. Can Can I bring up another thing though while we're on? Um, like about his 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 trilogy, the apartment trilogy. Sure. One thing that really got me going, and is I think part of the amusement, is um, scary, creepy old people core. <laughs> yeah. This, yeah. So core, like mm-hmm. like right out of um, Rosemary's Baby, you know, where uh, throughout the film with you know Ruth Gordon and everybody, mm-hmm. but at the end when they're like uh, you know having the big party and they're grotesque old people, like oh he's beautiful, your baby, you know. Um, <laughs> So like uh, that's repeated in this film mm-hmm. where they're pursuing him, her, him, excuse me, and are like uh, you know pawing at him like in this kind yeah. of like absurdist, yeah. like mm-hmm. uh, horror movie, like residence video kind of scene, music yes. video scene. And uh, but yes. then it started got me thinking of um, how I think of so much of David Lynch when I see this film. And one of the things is the very end of Mulholland Drive when they're those tiny, horrible little people that couple who are coming through yeah. the door, and it's like mm-hmm. what. What even is that? And I just want to add one other little thought is Polanski intentionally did something with casting. Mm -hmm. All of the old principal old people are American actors and actresses. They're American. Yeah. Okay. And then the young people are European. They're French, Mm -hmm. you know, like Isabella Johnny and stuff. So Mm -hmm. like there's something going on there like um, nefarious oldsters. Yeah. There's one one other Lynch kind of thing for me that really left out. At me when I saw this, like, oh, this is so David Lynch in tone, which is, yeah. <clears throat> and this is another big set piece in this movie, is when uh, Polanski's character goes to visit Simon Schul in the beginning of the film in the hospital. And of course, everything up to that point has been played, you know, pretty straight, mildly humorous. You know, we haven't been introduced to anything, you know, tense or harrowing of any kind at this point. Yes. So when when you see this image of Simon Shul in the bandages wrapped in, you know, broken bones and Dude. and then and you see her and then you close up on the face and that just guttural <laughs> horrible oh scream God. that is just with echo. going on and on and with echo <laughs> and it's yeah, I think it's electronically processed too. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yes. Some yes. of the tape is like slowed down too, like yeah. you know, like yeah, 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 like they yeah, took yeah. a tape and let and stuck it's, their finger uh, in the loop to like drag it's it on. It's a fucking total punch in the stomach kind of at the movie's moment. Yeah. It is, but it's like it's it is Lynch to sort of set up this kind of you know facade that everything yes. has in the movie. But then to it's have like that Winkies one almost. Thing. Yeah, it is like Winkies at Mulholland Drive, but it's like this one thing that just is going to pop like right out of the screen. In you know, mm. in, in contrast to every to the whole tone of everything you've just seen before it. Which well, is and also great. it's going to set the tone. The, like that that scream is going to resonate with you as you go on. Like yeah. that really mm-hmm. sour, unnerving, disturbing thing, and on all levels, like sensually, it is you yeah. know your, the sight and sound of it, and then also th- uh, um, the the vision of it. It's just like like God, that person is really. It's like seeing like a hardcore burn victim kind of thing. Yes. Like, that person yeah. is totally wrecked. Like this is it. This they could barely just get this going. A bit of the mouth, and otherwise a fully cast person. Yeah, and it's yeah. like uh, it's just a very, um, it's a, not a pleasant thought of what this person went no. through physically yeah. on their last no. days of life. Uh, no, I have to I have to backtrack to a couple of things to respond to because there's so oh. much. God, yeah. the timer's just going cranking down. But um, well, one, you know, I don't want to demystify the casting too much, but I did read that um, it was sort of a pragmatic sol- decision to cast all the young people from like French theater yeah. groups, you know, and then the older people were like more well known American actors, and that was so that they could like maybe have like a hit in America, you know. So that's yeah, why I can see that. that was sort of a, a shrewd, like you know, a shrewd business decision, you know, and because he and was that explains hoping the that dubbing. Would be a hit. That, that 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 explains the dubbing too of the movie right because it's, it's a yeah. it is a budget movie on some level i mean they did build a big set and all this stuff but it's not like a huge yeah. budget right. movie you know so it, i think that the, yeah they made they had to make some cuts somewhere and i think and they so yeah had the local french actors and that's yeah why the too. accents are yeah. I, I have heard polanski saying that there was intention because he could have mixed and matched a bit he mm-hmm. could have had an old French person. He could have had a young American actor. But he did. He that that was there was some intentionality. Yeah. In, yeah. more specifically, the uh, the elderly, like mm-hmm. the, the scary elderly, being yeah. American, um, is. Uh, uh, was, uh, you mentioned Ruth Gordon earlier. Like uh, Shelley Winters is playing like the exact kind of same role yes. as Ruth Gordon in in sure. Rosemary's Baby, right? Where she's like evil, or she's presented as evil. But then she has these sort of like grandma concerns, you know, like they just fixed that window too, you know, or like I always think yeah. about Ruth Gordon, like when she picks up the, the knife drops into the floor in Rosemary's Baby and she sort of like smooths out the part where the mark, knife yeah. landed with the, with the mark with her finger. Right. Um, I love that contrast of like, uh, you know, the, the grandma, <laughs> gra- the evil grandma who's still concerned with like uh, yeah. keeping the house yeah. clean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. But there's something going on. Uh, and, and, and again, the whole apartment in Rosemary's Baby was conspiring, objectively speaking, objective reality. It, it is a conspiring against Rosemary for like weirdly practical supernatural yeah. reasons. But um, reasons. so then um, and, and, and it just uh, um, I, I, there's some I guess what I'm trying to say, maybe just my quick observation is just something is very wrong with that apartment building. It might not be paranoia supernatural wrong but there's a lot of just super dysfunction going on in yeah. general like everyone's yeah. a little dinged and like it's it's a not a happy place no not at all no uh, uh, yeah absolutely not can i backtrack to one other thing because you just you just brought up paranoia and we're sort of talking about the intention how do you read into this movie you know so on mm-hmm. and so forth you know we obviously it is based on text it's based on topor's novel as you said but there is some allegory that others have pointed to um in how this movie can sort of relate to the experiences of polanski himself <clears throat> you know uh, obviously we talk about the manson the manson murders in this show quite a bit quite often um it does come up a lot on the show but you know, obviously, you know, he is a victim in that in many ways. His wife, you know, uh, being, you know, horribly murdered by the Manson family members. And his and, eight-month-old child uh, exactly. in, in the womb. Mm-hmm. I don't know how you recover from that at all. I, I know. Um, so, and it's, it's hugely public, you know, yeah. the, the tragedy. Exactly. And it's like you can you can see how or you can draw a line perhaps to – you know, the decision that Polanski makes to also put himself in the lead role is an interesting casting decision, you know, because yeah. that instantly carries a lot of weight, you know, and you could say how, OK, this movie is a portrait of, you know, him sort of, 
dealing with what he was experiencing around that time. The idea of everyone watching and whispering about him after he'd leave a room or the sense of guilt that he had or oh, more yeah, I see what you or, mean. Or, or sort of more, like more importantly, the paranoia that he suffered, you know, during this. Well, am I, I mean, next? Are well, people yeah. are people chasing Sharon Tate's husband now? And yeah, I'm going to get stabbed in a hallway. Well, I never thought yeah, of that. Yeah. Or that or just the idea of your neighbors being the ones that are wreaking havoc upon you, the people that yeah, are next yeah, door gotcha. and coming sure. in and, you know, forcing sure. you to be somebody else. I mean, that is also a part of it. It's also a part yeah. of it. You know, because the movie does make a lot of references, Marcus, you brought it up earlier, is uh, you hear the 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 landlord guy and you hear the cop in the film make references to the fact that, you know, he's not French. He's he's Polish. Right. Once anyone gets involved with the police, they're always looked on with suspicion, especially if they're not French. And and Immigrant. he's sort of ostracized. You know, he's yeah, he's mm-hmm. a, he's a, he's, a, he's a, there's some just some now, level of discrimination going on. And that happened yeah. to Roman and his yeah. sister because uh, they both, you know, uh, after the war, she first wound up in Paris and then he visited her and lived with her for a few years. And he wasn't getting a warm welcome. I don't know. Yeah. I've heard the French can be pretty insular about like you're either <laughs> French or you're shit, you know. He has uh, mentioned that, that in some ways it, it's being inspired by just the sort of pretentiousness of the Pari- Parisian environment that he yeah. was in. Um, when he was going to film school, I guess in Paris, right, and then, um, and then feeling like uh, it didn't really go for him the way that he wanted it to, yeah. being a foreigner, and then, yeah, wow. it can be yeah. tricky there. Yeah, and and so there is this theme of like, like discrimination, you know, or xenophobia, even if you want to go that far, snobbery in terms. Well, he's also Jewish, yeah. you know, so he felt that every everywhere, I guess, totally, you know? right, right, yeah, totally. I um, mean, he's he has that, but then you also have. In the film, there's that little girl uh, that's like disabled that they're that the whole building is rallying against. You know, to try to get them out of the building. You know, know. Simone Schul. There's references to her being a lesbian. You know, maybe mm-hmm. they didn't approve mm-hmm. of that. You know, so there is kind of this like loose threads of there's things. A pe- of like, yeah, the petition that really petition. foul woman who like comes right. in with the petition. That's what I was saying before. It's like it's like a really ugly slice of humanity that mm-hmm. building. Yeah. Like outside of his madness or not, or if there's any thing you should be paranoid about it's like it's an ugly slice of mm-hmm. you know modern times and specifically french parisian urban life you know uh and i thought that was kind of interesting because mm-hmm. i think that he uh like you're saying is uh had some personal insights about that mm-hmm. that he maybe brought to yeah what was otherwise not part of the topor book right it has a, a sure. little bit of yuppie nightmare quality to it too you know like early yuppie nightmare we talked about that like with like after hours <laughs> or whatever that that sort of like story you I mean, mean yeah, I always, when i was a kid with yeah i mean just that yeah just like the world's out to get him kind of thing you know it's like an after Got hours it. like the world is out to get him yeah, he's like this one right. sort of yuppie man against the whole world sure totally. that's how i saw it as a kid like i didn't i didn't like have all the um see all the idiosyncrasies as a child so i thought it was like i was like wow the world really is out to get him and turn him into a mummy or whatever you know or make him commit suicide i'll never forget showing this to a friend um after college and he was his interpretation was like so different than anyone else that i that, and i don't know if it has any validity to it or not but i'll just spit it out here but after right. watching it i was like wow it's pretty wild right and he was like yeah do you think that he killed her he killed simone you know he, <laughs> he pushed he killed simone so that he could have her apartment and all this stuff is just his guilt you know and he's like transforming oh, okay. into her so I, I don't know. I mean, out. you know, there is like, I think yeah, that, maybe fact, that's why she screamed when he was in the ho- hospital. Exactly. That was his main <sighs> argument was like, when she sees him, she starts to scream, you know, all right, stop, stop the clock. Like, <laughs> 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 all right. All right. Uh, well, shout out to your friend. That's um, great. That's great. Um, yeah, yeah that that's is Thomas, interesting. Thomas. Yeah. Uh, oh, wow. Okay. Oh, oh shout out to Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. I mean, you know, Hey, I mean, we, we talked about, again, another Lynchian sort of quality we've talked about in this show before. Shout out to our episode on Lost Highway in the archives. Mm-hmm. The idea of the fugue state, the idea like kind of inspired by O.J. Simpson of yeah. how you can totally be in a pathological right. different state of mind and, and yeah, create, you know, murder somebody. But then in the, you know, the other end of your psyche, you know, you're totally, you know, you have no idea that you've That's done that. That's a really you good can, observation. Like, yeah. uh, because um, it, I love it. actually, 
that's it's perfect that you're saying lost highway because it's about dealing with the unbearable weight of guilt about what you mm -hmm. did oj yeah. and uh you know the polanski character maybe is also maybe. a murderer you know yeah and uh and he can't escape it you know um that's and, hot uh, yeah no that's that's good yeah. i almost need to rewatch it just to think about it <laughs> can i can i kick off the, just just kick off us talk we usually at this halfway point start getting into some of our favorite scenes and this is kind of maybe i don't know it, it could dovetail right out of the conversation of what does this all mean uh but also spotlighting a great moment in the movie um obviously it, like identity is a big part of another theme yeah. of this movie like you know losing losing your own identity and becoming somebody other mm -hmm. somebody else and when does that start and when does that stop and there's a great sequence in the film um it's a, there's a lot of great stuff happening in this little section of the movie is when um polanski spending time with our favorite isabella Gianni in her apartment um yeah 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 you know shout out to her of course oh marcus has got there you some go show and tell here what you got there what is that I to the a yeah have to have to call out, bring it out for the Isabella Johnny record because you know when are, when else are you going to impress anybody? With that or or when else are you going to bring that out? You know? <laughs> yeah, Marcus uh, is the great, president of the he's the president of the Isabella Johnny fan club. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> yes, indeed. So um, shout out to her baby pictures in this movie, by the way. Just I know you want to go into something else, but I just just a yeah. real quick. I love it in a movie when you really get to see the actors' real baby pictures. You know, <laughs> right? It's great. No, it's no, yeah, Photoshop. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So, in well, he's this, with her. He's with her in bed. In bed. There's a great. I know what you're referring to. It's so good. There's a great section <laughs> where you know he's drunk. He's on his back. She's undressing him, and he's pontificating <laughs> on yeah. existence. And and when does a you know when do you stop being yourself with like the it's loss so of a body great. part? And kind of my become, favorite scene. I know, I know. And it's like, mm -hmm. not to like, you know, hypnotize you guys at all or anything, but like, you know, you could get heady with that because of terms of what he's sure. talking about. When do you stop being yourself? And, you know, when does you stop becoming you? Well, and, well just to spell it out a little bit, it's like, it's like, yeah, I lose my arm. Here's me. And over there is my arm. I lose two arms. There are my arms over there. But mm -hmm. what if you cut off my head? Is that... My head is now over here because I'm me, my body, or the other way around. And I got to say, I don't know if it's in the book, but that is such a Roland Topor kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, because th that monologue, really, you visualize it. You know what I mean? And it's totally. right out of, I, I know I'm repeating myself, but it's right out of a Topor uh, little um, uh, comic illustration is what I'm trying yeah. to say. Like, um, you know, he just does that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Not going to be quite right, so forget it. But, uh, well, it's perfect no, yeah. for this movie too because it really blurs. This movie really blurs the lines between like what's happening to him and his awareness of it. You know, like on one level, he's we don't get a lot of his inner monologue, but every once in a while, he's like, "They're trying to kill me." But then in the next scene, he's painting his fingernail like it's nothing. You know <laughs> yeah. I mean? ordering like he, different. What I love is the little idiosyncrasies, like. But you never order coffee, like like chocolate, yeah. right? You know, like this morning. Just that kind of yeah. thing, like, like uh, you know. Because, again, it's about, like, it's all so mid-century European existential considerations. A lot, so much of this, you know, mm -hmm. Roman and, and Roland. It's just like, um, and, and it involves identity in this inherent way where it's just like, you know, the reflection where it's a world without God. And, you know, there's not necessarily any particular context that any of us individual human species examples are so it's like uh, you're sort of floating aimlessly in space and it's like what exactly are you and uh, if you can't answer it or if you don't feel like answering it like you're kind of lost mm -hmm. and then anything can happen to you and you could take on the dead woman's identity uh, for whatever reason because I think also this guy is sort of a weak person here's a term I wanted to bring up too, just to keep going uh, on you mentioned after hours where there's a big Kafka influence mm -hmm. yeah. that Scorsese yeah. identifies. And I'm seeing Kafka all throughout this film and the characterization mm -hmm. of the lead Polanski character. It's this put upon small framed man and he's getting abused by boorish quote unquote friends. Like, <laughs> hey, motherfucker, what's going on? Like, let's party at your house and make a mess. Or like the, the you know, like 
the, the beggar just says like, I'll take your money. Thank you very much. <laughs> like everyone's, he's just like um, put upon and it mm -hmm. creates enormous anxiety, social anxiety, paranoia. Mm -hmm. So he's not coming from a very healthy place of, what am I trying to say succinctly? He doesn't have a strong identity. Mm -hmm. And he, and I think that with such a weak, watery identity, he could transform into just about anything because his identity is, um, is, is, is unformed. He's a very, and that's what you're saying before too, Mark, it's like, he doesn't have much of an inner life or inner monologue really. He's sort of a, a yeah. Like what a, does he do? <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a great yeah. go right there. <laughs> yeah. What's his past? What's yeah. any of his past? Yeah. 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 <laughs> no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, but I mean, you know, I, I just going back to that one beautiful scene where he's, you know, talking about, you know, what we were talking about earlier, when does, when do you mm -hmm. stop being you? You know, this idea of like, you know, yes, like in, in our, you know, our existence, we're made up of trillions of cells, you know, that are each in its own living organism, you know, but like you can extract those cells and they can live on their own in a Petri dish for a period of time. But, you know, mm -hmm. you are not unable to exist without them, you know, so it's like it's, it's just a, it's just a fucking trippy thought in terms of this Absolutely. idea of like you know our cells and when do we well at what point do we stop becoming who we are well, it's true you know? well we put so much emphasis on our heads and our faces heads. how about this yeah. how, let me just put it this way yeah. we talk to each other's faces right <laughs> right you know what i mean like so we're all head and and people do say we all say this in all languages i believe like hey look at my hands why am i possessing mm -hmm. my hands Right. It's more like look at this part of my body that are the hands part. Right. Not my yeah, most hands, people I think like associate my ears. Yeah, like they they I think when you think of yourself, don't a lot of people think of like that there's like a spirit or something inside them almost like well, driving the body before, like looking out through the eyes, right? It's now and like a, a, like, and you said, this world. my body like you said you don't realize that your body is you. You are your exactly. body. You know, it's like it's something different about um I don't know, like the semiotics in our culture, or just like the uh, that too, the yeah. way our language controls how we we think. You know, right. well, how about this and, and you... belief systems that are passed on to you, which mm -hmm. a lot of them collapsed in mid twentieth century, as I was saying before. By the way, yeah. we microdosed again, guys. So sorry. we did. We did. I was <laughs> yeah. about to say. I'm sorry. I, I was we about to peak. That. Go ahead. I I I, <laughs> I I was totally about to peak with the suggestion of you know when you donate an organ, man, you know like. <laughs> you know, and you are now in somebody else, brother. And, you know, so which yeah. which part of you, you know, now lives in somebody else? Um, no. But anyway, um, let's get into some of these scenes. I want to carve out some time for the ending, too, because that piece is amazing. Um, real quick, let's go with a funny one. Um, <laughs> I love this scene because it, it is it is again, it's it's cringe and it's funny at the same time. His fucking friend, his like his like provocateur. That's friend. what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, his I boorish, know. quote unquote friends. Yeah, I know. Dude, what? Who are they and why? It. Okay, but I know. Well, they're just <laughs> they're coworkers. They're not they really are, friends. Yes. No, but I they're know, so. Know. Yeah. Um, well, they're so overbearing, which is a perfect yeah. pairing for this weak-willed person. Sure. And yeah, you're talking about like like let's play marching band music. At I was going to say, like, yeah. Try to enjoy it while you can. You can't do it at home. <laughs> the scene where, yeah, his friend decides to crank what sounds like the police academy theme music on a stereo <laughs> at fucking 10. Now, that's a surrealist set piece as well, too. I mean, it really, truly is. Um, yeah. And then, of course, you know, his neighbor's being upset. Like, he's trying to prove the point that this is how you can behave. You don't have to, buy, you know, you don't have to curtail, you know, to your yeah. stupid neighbors. Like, you can, you can do Just that. Just tell them to know? stuff it. You know, yeah, and um, well, say, a, say like my my brother's the police commissioner. You're like fuck him. Yeah, right. yeah, right. He doesn't really. Gra I mean, he doesn't grasp the severity of the problem when the for the the tenant. It's like when he's in his apartment, he's like tiptoeing around and they're like banging on the walls, you know, or he, he knocks on that guy's door very very timidly, and they're like, "All right, all right, I'm not deaf," you know, like he doesn't he he doesn't need to blow it out for them to be um, upset with him, right? He's he's already trying to be like quiet and timid, not right? Nice. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. He doesn't want to ruffle those feathers. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, again, I mean, we should just talk about, is there anything else you guys want to say about um, um, Isabella Gianni? I mean, like uh, we mentioned that one moment in her, um, in, in, in that scene we were talking about just a little bit ago. Hey, but, bed. I mean, 
Yeah, in bed, but I mean, she's, she's got an amazing sh- look in this movie. You know, yep. she looks yep. amazing. Um, yeah, the the jacket, the glasses. Actually, I I would want to say that um, you know she was becoming a really mega hot star at that time. She was working with Truffaut in that great movie, Story of Adele H, around that time. But mm-hmm. actually, what I liked there was just one scene that felt like, wow, that's a great screen presence, and it's when she's about to go to work, and um, she's saying, "You just stay here." Yeah, I, I got some croissants. Mm-hmm. Just relax. Don't worry about. It. Just stay. Just you know that thing when you crash over, you know, and they have to go to work. So mm-hmm. it's like um, her face really elicits like there's a lot of love and sympathy and warmth, and it's it's like her face is just so um, so purely like uh, like what am I trying to say? Like um, like sympathetic, and 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 it's the most human warm facial expression in the entire film Mm -hmm. maybe because there aren't many right if you think about it like it's very loving and it's very kind and it's very soft to him because she does care about him and that's Mm -hmm. why it's so brutal because of course this is a polanski film that Mm -hmm. minutes later he's tearing apart her childhood treasure photos of her past because and it's so ugly because you know you never see her again i mean really other than that weird little thing at the end yeah but she that character's gone because what i'm saying is that warmth and that love that's elicited in her, her great performance her face is is completely severed because he alienates himself from that because she's part of them right mm-hmm. and i find that like really heartbreaking because it's like her face in that morning is the, his last chance to connect yeah with people right and it breaks my heart right it's, it's kind of like watch Very it's kind of like that scene in um that scene in straight time shout out again we're cutting a lot of our yes old episodes, exactly you know but nice it's, <laughs> it's 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 kind of like you're right you know shout out to the arc ar- ar- in our archives you can watch one fucking hour in straight time Classic. one of our favorite favorite movies of all time but um there's that there's that one scene where it's like dustin hoffman's last chance at at escaping exactly. this life of crime this dark path that he's on you know he can just you know like Roman Polanski could just be with Isabella Gianni like that could be it yeah. you know mm-hmm. but of he could course, just say it's not that simple what was I thinking that's not my landlord knocking at her door like take a deep breath yeah do mm-hmm. some sit-ups like you know yeah. like just calm the hell down but he's too we know he's too far gone and that's what's yeah. so sad he had a chance but he's he's disassociated too mm-hmm. much from love yeah. that's right in front of him mm-hmm. right yeah. She also does a great job communicating just that her damagedness post her friend being hurt, yes. you know, like her eyes and just the emotion. And she's, yes. because she's Isabella Johnny, she's great at communicating that, you know. Um, yeah. I think this is as good a time as any to call out, like, you know, we used to have this thing where we would just not only praise a movie, but talk about stuff that didn't work. And there is a major thing in this oh, movie, great. and it affects his Bella Johnny. Warm, and that warm. this is one of the <laughs> this is one of the most <laughs> insane, like dubbing, like most oh, <laughs> oh, okay. situations of any movie, yeah. you know. And like, um, and I it never bothered me. You know, I didn't even probably notice it. I saw it so young, but I remember showing this to other people, and they would yeah. be snickering and laughing because the, the, the know. you know the the dubbing was so jarring and you I, you really feel it a lot with her and just the sound design and stuff and well, to be fair like, it, it does kind of flaw it, it, it's a flaw yeah. in the movie and i think it has hurt it you know i mean maybe people can overlook it now it's funny that they show the bruce lee movie in this because it does yeah. almost have that kind of like kung, yeah. like dubbed kung fu movie quality you know? i know it's that it's I that uh, broad like in the execution mm-hmm. by the way quick shout out like that's one of my favorite curveball moments ever I like, know. hey, what's playing? This European art film, and it's like fucking Enter watching the dragon. lots of Enter the Dragon. Yeah. It's so hot. That is such yeah. a dope move. It you is. know, and I want to be is. there at a weird matinee in Paris watching a. Yeah. Not to mention dragon. that Bruce Lee and Sharon Tate were in a movie together, right? Whoa. Yeah. Plansky was friends with uh, Bruce Lee, too. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Um, but what you were saying about the dubbing, though, it's like, you know, maybe it's like. Seeing a movie like this with that dubbing, it's like my brain goes to like giallo mode a little bit where like I can yeah. put my giallo goggles on and be okay with it, you know, um, mm-hmm. you know, or, or Herzog. We, we watched, um, we watched Aguirre. It's similar. Um, but right. Tom was hipping me to this idea before we were recording that there is a French version of the movie out there somewhere. Well, there's a, there's a different. Yeah. I, I mean, there's, we're seeing the American version. But right. I believe that the European or maybe all the other markets, the version of that wow. was Shelley Duvall is dubbed. 
and Isabella is speaking French, you know, and maybe it's huh. like subtitles. Shelly I'm not Winters. 100% sure. I, yeah. Shelly Winters. Oh, sorry, not- <laughs> excuse me. Shelly Winters dubbed, <laughs> yeah. and then there's like um, French and only or with subs. But right. it's not the – we just wind up keep see, uh, keep seeing like the, um, you know, the 1976 like – American right. movie theater version, but right. didn't it wasn't always the experience for it, filmmaking. It, film it's viewers. got me thinking, like wondering if they even shot with sync sound or if it was just mo, you know, Italian style I, MOS. I've heard, you know, you like, hear her dialogue uh, in some versions, like you hear huh. her speaking French. I've Damn, heard that. so that's there's that. That's anyway. cool. Um, can we talk about the Sex in the City uh, moment in this movie? What? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. I'm stumped, homie. I'm, I'm nothing, and where are you going with this? No, Please. the scene, the scene where he takes out the box of shoes and starts. Uh, oh my god! You're <laughs> <killing> me. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's below. He's he's Jimmy chewing and Malola blonicking. Uh, the the he's motherfucker. Manoloing, in that scene. He's manoling so hard. <laughs> I know he's, he's fucking doing hard. Carrie. Oh, yeah, you fucking bastard. Wow. Yeah, but he is Roman Bradshaw. Yeah, it, when he's nice one. when he's um when he's digging into <laughs> that and he starts talking to himself about the shoes and then he looks. I know and he's holding the shoes and he goes. I think I'm pregnant. God, dude. I think I'm pregnant. That's yeah. insane. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. That's, yeah, that's Bradshaw all the way. Nice one. <laughs> wow. Nice one. Never yeah, made the connection in my head. It's shortly thereafter too, where it's that scene where then you kind of get the 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 bookend of his teeth being gone, which is a creepy yeah. image. And then of course he that. looks into the wall and finds two of his teeth in the wall. That's cool. And you know, and he again, was finding like, his teeth in the reality of his mind. Yeah, it's like it's not like what? a stranger's teeth. You know, yeah, those are like right. his teeth. And of course, he has his teeth when he talks to the landlord a little while later. Yeah, in the objective real world you know right yeah well is that when he's having the fever dream because there is a moment when he does have oh, that yeah. fever dream which is is that when he's with isabella gianni there is that too when he keep when going he, uh, or, or no sorry it's not the, i'm sorry it's after it's from he the diarrhea <laughs> he gets he yeah gets, he gets himself <laughs> yeah. sick from the girl ladies right, right. the lady the, the, uh, like, neighbor's it, diarrhea excitedly um leaving a gift for everybody Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then he goes. That's when he goes to the bathroom and discovers the hieroglyphics, and then uh, right, mm-hmm. yeah, right. But when he so, comes back, there's like a weird thing there where, like, in that scene, uh, I don't know if you're going to mention this, Evan, but like th- when he's like yeah. walking through the room of his of his room, there's like oh, a special that. built set, like uh, it's one yeah. of those Ames rooms. Yes, where it's, like the perspective is all weird. Yeah, yeah it's you know, cool. And I guess I guess they built it in, intending to have more scenes shot with it, but oh, it yeah. didn't really work that well. So they just left that one shot they in. But you can shot. tell. I felt it too. Uh, in when I was watching this time. Uh, he goes up to the window. And all of a sudden, the window's a lot bigger. Like when he finally gets up scale. to the window, it's like it's a, right. the scales off. So well, the the, oh, the whole yeah. thing is a set. I, I found out mm-hmm. recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I thought it was filmed just at a courtyard, uh, you know, in, in Paris. But uh, it's a yeah. it's a sound stage. Well, it kind of looks Hitchcock. I kind of love that. It does look like yes. rear window. Rear window. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It does yeah. have that. Yeah lighting feel to it whenever you see out the window down into the courtyard it kind of has that feel um yeah. definitely yeah, yeah. yeah. all those crane like, shots you know yeah right oh the crane the, shots the crane, in the beginning yeah. the crane shots in the yeah, beginning are someone, amazing you know again I, I read this jonathan rosenbaum review and he just his first paragraph is great it just breaks down the credit sequence because it's quite uh, odd and, and in a weird way it's like uh the whole film is in the credit sequence like there's like spoilers or something or mm-hmm. or it doesn't make sense like you know uh you guys remember it's like um you see polanski looking out the window uh dolly sh- or the crane shot goes down to the courtyard yeah. then it goes up and it's some other person mm-hmm. is right where he was standing and on and i on. love that because it works with like it only works if you know if you have a face like polanski that you recognize you know what i mean otherwise you yeah. may not catch it but i love that right that detail but yeah it's, it's, it's a pretty um, uh, masterful surreal uh and then there's a cutout opening like a cutout of Polanski they use a couple of times and they use it yeah. in the oh. opening scene too. Oh, right? oh, that's so cool. Wow. Yeah. That's kind of Hitchcocky too, you know, like director cameo it is. vibe. But, but it's, it's like also, uh, yeah. demented Hitchcock. Yeah. It is. It is. But like shout out to anybody like Tenebrae. I don't know. Is anybody thinking Tenebrae? When I, was, I thought opening? Tenebrae too. Uh-huh. I thought like okay. that the yeah, shot yeah. in Tenebrae must be aping this one. Because it's the very uh, next, yeah, next be year, right? Yeah. I, yeah. Was, I was thinking that must have been inspired by it. Yeah, that crane, I guess, was sort of a new 
the Luma crane like that they mm-hmm. use on it's like sort of a um, remote control powered crane where you don't have to sit at the driver's seat. I guess that was, you know, you didn't have to sit up high. You could do it. You could control the crane from down below. Yeah. So I guess that was sort of like a new piece of technology that would premiere. That, yeah. You know, which is kind of like The Shining, right? Where like you have a new piece of technology yes. introduced. Yes. You know, that's just another parallel with The Shining. This is like the uh, French Shining the in some ways. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. It, it really is. You know, well, it's yeah. like, uh, well, the thing that I like, when did, what were we talking about recently where it's like, yeah, it's a ghost story, but it's not, oh, well, don't look now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, um, there's yeah. ghost story tropes and sort of classic, go- there's like classic, yeah, yeah, it's just like don't look now. It's classic goth mm-hmm. uh, tropes and characteristics but meeting hardcore Modernity. weird mid to late century existential yeah, yeah. Uh, psychedelicized uh yeah. you know like perspectives you know and and, and it's because the thing is like you could look at it simply or someone might have adapted the story and it was simply literally her ghost this is mm-hmm. simple or, or, or she was possessed by a haunted ghost that was there before or he killed her <laughs> as we said before. well no well that's very kind of practical but i mean like, oh, you know, like literally it's a, it's a ghost story egyptian like, voodoo and then in story 1890 yeah. yeah it's like and then in 1891 in this old photograph you see she's standing in the same spot like someone and yeah. but, but what i'm saying is the shining also tracks as being yeah. like a ghost story but it's got all this other, other weird sh- shit on it shit part, going on you know yeah. i love that yeah that's very cool. there's a lot of films like that well, Back then. real quick, because I, I do want to carve out some time for the ending. Just real quick, shout out to an amazing image. The fucking basketball bouncing that turns into oh. the head is <laughs> Which top reminds shelf. me of the Toby Dammit, uh, the Fellini uh, yes. part of uh, Spirits of the Terrence Dead, Stamp. Toby Dammit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, but yeah. that is brilliant. Yeah. And there's great sound design there is. throughout the whole film and right then, too. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know what I love is like this, the, the, um, the anticipation, like, well, the head bouncing and up and then it's bouncing down. What's going to come? Is it going to come up again? Is it going to be the head again? You know yeah. what I mean? It's cool. It's yeah. like, yeah, because oh, it, it, it's first the ball, then the head. It's just like, and yeah. then, of course, the bizarre, uh, like, um, Alice in Wonderland, uh, like, trial <laughs> in the courtyard right. below. Yeah. 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 Dude, with the little girl with, with the Polanski yeah, right. mask. That's it. Like, you're right. Is. It is like a stage, uh, like a medieval stage play or something, because they're yes. torturing Punch the and little Judy. girl, but they're actually torturing him. And you, you, you you're, yeah. you're, you're kind of like, oh no, don't hurt the little girl. And then all of a sudden, she's like, there he is. There you know, he she's, is. Yeah, it's she's like in a, on Judy, it with them. <laughs> like Shakespeare, Shakespeare play. Yeah, it does have totally. that. That's yeah. when the film is like totally nuts. You know, and mm-hmm. I love it. Yeah, you mentioned sound. I gotta gotta shout out the music in this, which is so good. And it like is a great. lot of the my favorite things, are, I guess, are played on wine glasses. You know, that's that kind of oh. like uh, synthy sound that you're hearing. Cool. It's literally those, wine glass figures on wine glass. Wine glasses filled with water, and the person do, you know they got one of those people that plays yeah. glasses because there's a lot of glass in the movie. You know, so that was the idea. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's cool. So cool. Very. I love yeah. that. I love great that. Great soundtrack thematic tie-in to the score it's cool mm-hmm. um yeah. so the ending i mean you know again one other interpretation of this movie as we've touched on a little bit earlier is this idea of the refusal to conform you know the idea that right. you know you are being told what to do when you're under the control of others and if you can't conform well then fuck it i'm just gonna jump out the window <laughs> you know yolo fuck it fuck right everybody and right. um uh, that's kind of what's on display here, man, is him dropping out big time. And uh, I, it's it, it would be one thing if it was him launching himself out of the window and then that's the end or whatever. We get that little set piece in the courtyard. But the fact that he does it a second time... I know. Is, I know. <laughs> it's pushing it that much further into a new realm. When you see him all bloody mm-hmm. up there on the windowsill... Yeah. And he's going to do like it. Leap out. That really puts this movie over the top for me. Is that it's a second time fall, and it's mm-hmm. brutal. The second and, and, fall is and, so. And the brutal. audience, and, well, the audience. Oh, by the way, the audience. Because there's another yeah. element. By the way, well, yeah, I'm not. Yeah. To, I'm totally right. 100 percent of where you're at. But there's that that um, that very classic European theater, the absurd feel of like suddenly everyone's applauding and and eagerly awaiting, get their lawn, getting their lawn chairs out. To watch yeah. the suicide, you know. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's yeah. so topor. So to- yeah. I know I keep saying. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. like no, but what what you're saying is like, um, what I love uh, in the second attempt to jump is all the 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 uh, crowd's reaction, the audience reaction, yeah. where they're like, oh, 
no. And they're like, wait, yeah, dude, yeah. like, get the <laughs> fuck out of here. Like, you know, like, yeah. it's like incredulous, you know? It they're is. so aghast. It's, it's like performance yeah, it is really It's like, it's insane. Yeah. Yeah, go yeah it's like Gigi Allen. I was just going to say, like, it's like oh, a Gigi Jesus. Allen uh, deathmatch wrestling uh, spot. Yeah. Yes. You know? Totally. <laughs> you know? Like, it no, is. don't. Hurt your eyes, like no. Yeah, stop yeah. It's jumping. total deathmatch wrestling. Sorry, Marcus. What? Go ahead. It is interesting. Wow. Well, it's kind of like we get both versions of the of the suicide. We get the 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 imaginary or evil one where everyone's oh. clapping, and we get the right. You know, the like everyone. Yeah, in it's horror. true. It's funny. He gives both of those to us. Yeah, that's true. true. And that's been true. again as Rosenbaum is observing that for whatever reason, Polanski in the second half of the film is going back and forth with objective and subjective reality. And that's ex- yeah. a perfect example. Yeah. It's like, like everyone's applauding almost like it's a, like a weird magical mystery tour segment or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, like it's surreal. Like, or Fellini. It's all very Fellini. You know, <laughs> you, you know um, what also and then, punctuates uh, that? And then you know it's just grim reality. Like, like, like don't do yeah. it. You idiot. What's wrong? <laughs> you know what? He's wearing you know a what, dress. Yeah, exactly. But you know, what really punctuates the idea of separating kind of, you know, what's in his head and then what really happens is the idea that the music builds to a crescendo and but when he falls out of the window no music and there's no music mm. for oh, a, a good notice few that. beats there when he's going through the window crashing laying there it, there's no music there's no score nice. and that kind of under and that gives it a, a, a like a realism that's you know an objectivity punch. I love punch. That. Yeah, a punch. Yeah. There's, another, there's, uh, it's so cool. there's another cool little moment with the music earlier where like he's uh he's there's the music's playing and then all of a sudden someone knocks at the door and the music stops right when that person knocks you know like yeah. they interrupt the music yeah. they interrupt the vibe yeah. yeah totally well he's another director who values sound uh and we've always pointed that out you know uh, and uh it's very subtle but like i think uh maybe i read this or thought about it but not unlike eraser head the use of oppressive sound it's like someone in a shitty apartment you know eraser head and they're surrounded by yeah. just uh like off-site unseen oppressive sounds you know what i mean um right right and that's that's used very well and very subtly all throughout the tenant too you know totally totally uh one quick shout out here because i wanted to definitely you know, anytime we can dunk on Ebert, uh, we tend to do it Ooh, here. Please. <laughs> he loved it. He hated it. Um, he did? Holy I shit. think he, I think he gave the movie one star. Maybe it's like his... One? Uh, I think God, it's one star. One. I think it's one star. I think it was... It's like stir-crazy uh, level movie. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, Go ahead, sorry. it's 76, so it's a little early on, but I think he saw it at Cannes. And oh man, mm-hmm. he was he was just tearing into it, and sort of felt like you yeah. know th- that that this should have been like a twenty thirty minute night gallery sort of episode, or 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 that it had a night gallery mm-hmm. ending, and that mm-hmm. it like you know should have been like okay. actually it's so funny you brought up Toby, damn it, because he his complaint was that it should have been a twenty thirty minute segment within an anthology film is how he thought oh, it should wow. be, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, so spirits of the dead, yeah. yeah. I, don't, I guess I it didn't do well. It didn't do well at Cannes overall, right? Like I think it, got it was negative. a box office and critical failure. Uh, and I, I didn't know go. that ever. I thought critics embraced it. I looked up a Pauline Kael review, and she, she it didn't cycle with her reviews that year, uh, right. so she didn't say anything. But like I didn't know it was panned. I thought people yeah. would. I thought it was a classic, kind of from Jump uh, for people, but it, no, it's not. Yeah, it's been reevaluated. Yeah, I wonder yeah. what the story of its comeback was. You know, I guess vi- home video. Yeah, <laughs> you know? probably. I guess so. Yeah, a little bit of maybe a cult it's on the Z-, Z channel or something. It's very Z, Z-, Z- channel. channel. I don't know if it was, <laughs> totally. but it, it feels very. It Z feels like it, a Z channel reevaluation. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could totally see that. Yeah. Like well, I mean, totally. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's a real cool. I don't want to quite say deep cut but i mean it is kind of a gem in the polanski catalog obviously yeah. you know rosemary's baby chinatown you know huge huge movies yeah. but tenant is repulsion tenant is a great sort of next tier polanski yeah. film i think it's it's if got a, a lot fan, going on yeah. it's worthwhile yeah it's very yeah. dense and it's just a real joy like it's a it's a master you know you're just going you know letting a master do his thing you're just seeing it every all the choices are great you know, and he's good as an actor, and he gives a great performance. We didn't say that. Yes. <laughs> All right. Definitely. All right, everybody. That was one fucking hour on The Tenant. Just getting it barely in there. Thanks, everybody, for listening to that. 
Um, and thanks for picking that movie too, man. I mean, again, I know. you guys, have, nice one, guys. You guys, mm-hmm. you guys have proved week after week that y'all have great taste. And um, I haven't been. I mean, you know, of course, we're we're we're, we're putting movies that we want to do on the polls every week. Well, yeah. But this string of but this string of choices has been really stellar. I think it's from, been pretty dope lately, actually. Yeah. Death yeah, dream, definitely. like yeah. didn't see yeah. that coming. I did not see that coming. Yeah, exactly. So, um, well. Again, as mentioned at the very top of the show, what we're doing for next week is a little bit different. We uh, are not going to be doing a poll for 1977. We're going to forego the poll uh, so we can pay tribute um, to our, you know, to our homie, (laughs) William Friedkin, uh, who we, of course, um, have talked about a bunch on this channel before, of course, with French Connection and with Cruising. And for 1977, we're going to get into his... uh, Man, this is a dense topic. We're going to get into his film, Sorcerer, and we're just going to automatically pick it, strike the poll for next week. So next yeah. week is one fucking hour because, on Sorcerer. Because, just to be clear, it would have been on the poll, Sorcerer. Yes. Yeah. So, and we feel, our gut tells us that it probably would win, but yeah. we're like, let's just get right to it. Like, fuck it. Let's you know. just give it to him, man. Like, you yeah. know, um, and uh, yeah, and, 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 and one thing I'll, I'll be excited to talk about a little bit. Um, just to memorialize him is I had an opportunity to work with him on two different occasions, very small projects, you know, nothing, nothing crazy. You know, I wasn't on set for mm-hmm. bug, you know, or anything, but you know, there's a couple of, um, there's a couple of, uh, smaller projects that, uh, that we worked on together and he was a fucking class act throughout the yeah. whole Shit. process. Yes. And he was also, man, talk about a guy who missed, uh, his opportunity at a career in stand-up comedy. I mean, this dude could, can <laughs> really? tell a story. He is one of my, the funniest uh. storytellers ever. I actually, when I was um, regularly producing huh. Advice and I was doing regular YouTube content for Vice, I just wanted to do a movie review show with just him where we send him off to oh, the movies no. and he mm-hmm. watches the movies of the week and he comes back with his five minute capsule review and we actually did shoot a little piece with him and the director of oh god what was it that boston mob movie um help me johnny depp Down? plays no no plays oh. uh whitey bulger oh, J- um, Black whatever the Whitey Fraska. Bulger movie is, yeah. whatever the Whitey okay. Bulger movie Black was, Black Sunshine, <laughs> <laughs> and whatever. well, because mainly, oh, ma- okay, mainly because Friedkin I think was a character witness during the fucking trial, you know, because he knew what? he was a connected ass guy. I mean, he knew mob guys all over town, and that's yeah, what I was so that. exhilarating yeah. about him is that he just touched so many different corners of. Yeah. Yeah. So many different subcultures and undergrounds and underworld. He got on street level. Uh, he for, did yeah, for, for his he whole did. life. Yeah, it's true. He, he did. Yeah, so we'll do it. So it, that's just, awesome. Yeah. He used to come, you know, I have oh, fond memories too. I used to come by the theater occasionally, you know, and hang out, yes. hold court on the patio, and talk movies yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And it was so great, you know. And it, more than once, and I thought he was a really cool, down to earth guy, and always loved talking about movies. So. Dude, dude, one hundred percent. Actually, one of the things I shot was at the theater with. Friedkin was one of the projects that we did. Oh, okay. Was, yeah. Uh, yeah, we did that, which I'll get into next week because there's a, fun, a couple of funny stories. There you go. Uh, on and that, and just, so. we, we are definitely carving out plenty of time for the uh, the backstory for the sorcerer because, yeah. um, you know, in our grand tradition, we, we love our magnolias, yeah. the films <laughs> that are at, come after a director's big film, Boogie yep. Nights, Begat Magnolia, Taxi Driver, Begat in New York, New York, you know, like, and Sorcerer is his magnolia after the exorcist so there's so much backstory baby got backstory maybe the big one you know, like, <laughs> baby got backstory. Yeah, yeah it's another one yeah. of those episodes it is man yeah and sorcerer i mean god there's some incredible set pieces in it you know there's some fucking tangerine dream. shit tangerine dream oh there's going to be so much yeah. to get into with this episode. It's going to be a hard hour. I know it. So it's going to be a great episode. We're going to force it on y'all. But hey, man, RIP to William Friedkin, man. Um, you made a big impression on me, I know, and the show. So I feel like we owe it to uh, Friedkin to uh, cover his yeah. flick. So we'll do that next week. And then we'll be back with the polls for 1978, 79, 80. And we're going to keep this rolling for as long as we're going to keep it rolling. <laughs> you know, I, I like thought maybe. Well, I thought like. <laughs> Should we yeah. go to a hundred? Should we 
to we get to 99? 100. I, I don't What's know. What's the 100th like, year? <laughs> well, well, about? that's where we'd cut it 2000. off. You know, 90. 2000, 90. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think right. I'm going to need a break. Like okay, in 1994. Okay, like, okay, okay, okay. I don't know. Right. I don't know. Or like Clueless. more like you tell 1980. Us. We'll do, we'll do like 1985, Clueless. like out of Africa. Like, give me the fuck out of here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. True that. True that. True that. I'm kidding. So, I don't know. There's good 85 movies. We yeah, did yeah, one. Yeah. Uh, after yeah. Hours. We did. Um, anyway. So, but anyway, for the now until you know Tom's done, we will do one yes. uh, one well, movie each episode for a year, whatever. We'll be doing this gimmick, so stay tuned, everybody, for that uh, next week. Sorcerer, get your pre watch in, and definitely sign up for the Patreon, Patreon dot com slash one fucking yeah. hour. You got to check out our fucking audio commentary on what Tom? What was it? What when one? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, women want. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's. I always yeah. imagine that title is what dogs hear when humans talk, and all the words that aren't their name. You know, like skipper, skipper. You know, you guys know what I'm saying? Is yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. Clear? Very far side. Yeah. No, but is it clear? Side. Yeah, it's very far side. No, but it's like I always imagine like like people talk to dogs and cats like you know like they're understanding anything except that sound that is their voice that is their name yeah yeah yeah, you know? yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah. what women want sounds like you know or like you got it you yeah know, uh, charlie brown school teacher yeah, you know? it does yeah. it does exactly. so get on the patreon or join the youtube channel down below click the button five bucks a month uh we're going to be putting out audio commentary tracks twice a month we got some other ones, uh, some other bangers lined up, but for right now, it's fresh, hot off the presses. Whoa, woman, want you can watch us watch that fucking movie. That this movie is fucking insane. If you've never seen it or haven't seen it since it came out, you're gonna want to watch it. And why not do it with us? So get get on that. Yeah. Um, and of course, everybody, we cannot uh, leave you at all without your beautiful, wonderful moment of zen. All right, everybody, it's time to say goodbye. Have a great uh, rest of your week, and we will see you next week for Sorcerer. All right, everybody, take care. Bye-bye. So long. A new invention, which was called Luma, it still is Luma, kind of crane that uh, allows you to have a camera at the end of the crane and being uh, operated from the post down, quite far from the place where camera is actually operating. And I, was, I got really very interested in it. This was a bunch of young people who invented it and needed some kind of promotion. Now they're very famous. What you see at uh, football uh, matches and uh, it's, it started on, on the tenant. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs> Wicked, man.